we will take the national as well as the futa anthems. Shall we take our seat as we sustain the applause for the nation's leading university of technology? <laughs> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, in continuation of the program for the, of the 28th convocation of our university, we have today the convocation lecture. It will be delivered by Professor Michael Faborode former Vice Chancellor of Bafemi Awolowo University and Secretary General, Association of Vice Chancellors of Nigeria University. Shall we give him a rousing round of applause? The title couldn't have been more timely. Scholarship, Globalization, and Underdevelopment with the University of Technology. And given his erudition and pedigree, I am convinced that he will do justice to the topic. Another round of applause for him, please. Here to direct affairs, we have leaders of our academic community. And as pro protocol will demand, I will start with members of the governing council of our university. Some moments ago, the chairman of the governing council Dr. Mohamed Chata stepped out. I'm sure he will still return. But here are some members of our governing council. We have Professor Mrs. Ebiyinka Agwolafu A round of applause for her, please. <laughs> Architect Benjamin Chidioke Naji, a round of applause for him, please. <laughs> Professor Afolabi Akintunde Akindaunsi, a round of applause for him, please. Professor Agwola Simeon Ogunlowo, a round of applause for him, please. Of course, somebody is wearing two caps today. Professor Olubode Kolade Koriko is also a council member. A round of applause for him, please. He's also the Dean School of Sciences. Can we double the applause then? Our number one citizen is here, the Vice Chancellor of our institution, Professor Adebiyi Gregory Daramola. The Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic, Professor Olatunde Arayela. 
Dr. Mrs. Modupe Olayinkaja is the chief scribe as well as the register of our institution. <laughs> Mr. Emmanuel Ademola Oreshego is the boss of our institution. <laughs> Dr. Belao Olatunde Badamoshi is the librarian of our institution. <laughs> the deans of our various schools are also here. Professor Shedrak Olufemi Akindele is the Dane School of Agriculture and Agricultural Technology. <laughs> Professor Michael Olarewaju Alatishe is the Dane School of Engineering and Engineering Technology. <laughs> Professor Julius Ajilowo Olujimi is the Dane School of Environmental Technology. <laughs> Professor T.M. Obamuyi is the Dean School of Management Technology. <laughs> Professor Moses Oludari Ajewole is the Dean School of Uzrade Studies. <laughs> Professor Boniface Kayode Aleshe is the Dean Students Affairs. <laughs> Why Professor Adeagbo is the Dean of the Youngest and Fastest Growing School the School of Health and Health Technology. I'd like to quickly recognize some key personalities who have also joined us there. We have Ms. Agnes Coppin, Director, International Affairs and Students and Scholars, Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University. Professor Adebisi Balogun is the former vice chancellor of our institution. <laughs> Dr. Femi Oguntu Ashe is our former librarian. A round of applause for him, please. <laughs> Professor Tolu Lokpe Akimbogun is the former deputy vice chancellor development. A round of applause for him, please. <laughs> At this point, in time, I'd like to recognize the registrar designate, Mr. Richard Arifalo, the registrar in waiting, as it were. May I, at this juncture, invite our Vice Chancellor, Professor Adebi Gregory Daramola, for his address. The Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academics, I take that again. The members of the Governing Council here present, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academics, the Registrar, the Bursa, the University Librarian, Chairman Committee of Deans, and other deans that are pre here present, S of departments, directors, professors, members of Senate, members of congregation, our distinguished lecturer of today, the Secretary General of Association of Vice Chancellors of Nigerian Universities, who also happen to have been a former vice chancellor of the Obafemi Awolowo University in Ife. Staff, students, alumni, and friends of the university, I want to specially welcome Ms. Agnes Scopin all the way from Tallahassee in Florida. You're welcome. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this auspicious occasion of a special lecture marking one of the events of the 28th Convocation Ceremony of this great university, the Federal University of Technology, Akure. It is particularly gratifying that today's event will be the last of such Convocation lectures I will be chairing as Vice Chancellor of this great university. <laughs> the journey in the last five years has been challenging, tedious, interesting, eye-opening, tasking, but nonetheless fulfilling. In all of this, I give all the glory to the Almighty God 
the author and finisher of our faith, that piloted my humble self and, this, and my team thus far. I proudly acknowledge the support of the teammates, my teammates, starting with the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Academics, Professor Latunde Arayela, the Registrar, Dr. Mrs. Mudupe Ajayi, the Bossa, Mr. Emmanuel Loreshagun, the Liberian, Dr. Bilao Badamosi, and of course, I can't but mention the names of Professor Tolu Lokwe Akimbogun, who was my Deputy Vice Chancellor for four years, as well as the erstwhile University Liberian, Dr. Femi Oguntuashi. I appreciate all the members of staff of the university who have given their support and contributed significantly to the success of this administration. The title of today's lecture for the 28th Convocation Ceremony is Scholarship, Globalization, and Underdevelopment with the University of Technology. To be delivered by a distinguished scholar of international repute, the former Vice Chancellor of Obafemi Aulo University, Lefe, and now the Secretary General of Association of Vice Chancellors of Nigerian Universities, Professor Mike Oladimeji Fabrodi. <laughs> Professor Mike Fabrodi was born in Shupari, Akoko, Ondo State, to the family of late Pa Esso Fabrodi. He had his elementary education at St. John's Primary School, Oka Akoko, and the secondary education at the Victory College, Ikare Akoko, both in Ondo State. He then proceeded to the University of Ife, now Obafemi Aulo University, Ife, where he obtained his bachelor's degree and master's degree in agricultural engineering in 1978 and 1983, respectively. I pause to say here that Professor Mike Farber they made a first class on us in agricultural engineering. <laughs> he thereafter backed his doctoral of philosophy degree in agricultural engineering from the University of Newcastle, Newcastle upon Tyne in the United Kingdom in 1986. After his mandatory national youth service program at the School of Agriculture and Fisheries, Paracot, River State, where he served as an instructor. Professor Michael Fabrodi was employed as a site engineer with rubber irrigation project, Mokwa, where he worked between 1978 and 1980. He was later employed as a research assistant at the International Institute for Tropical Agriculture, Ibadan, and served the institution from 1980 to 1983. Professor Michael Fabrodi started his teaching career as lecturer too at the then Federal Polytechnic Akure, that, that campus used to be here before they relocated to Adoikiti in 1983 and later joined the service of Obafemi Olo University Levy as lecturer one in 1986. He rose through the ranks to the grade of a professor in the same university in 1996. Professor Farrell Day held various management positions at Obafemi Law University, Lefe, which prepared him for the appointment and elevation to the position of the Vice Chancellor of the institution in 2006. He research, his research interests are in the area of rural environments and livelihood, biomaterial properties and bioprocess engineering, with emphasis on crop storage, biosafety, and the deformation mechanics of biomaterials, environmental impact of agricultural mechanization, natural resources management, and rural development, to mention but a few. Our convocation lecturer has contributed immensely to the body of knowledge in the area of specialization, in his area of specialization, as he has written many books and published several papers in national and international journals. Professor Fabro Ode is a member of many professional associations. He's a member of the Commonwealth Association of Development for Development, member of Nigerian Material Society, member of Nigerian Biomathematical Society, fellow Nigerian Society of Agricultural Engineers, fellow Nigerian Institute of Builders. 
he has received numerous awards, such as the Nigerian Society of Engineers Merit Award in 1989, Distinguished Alumni Merit Award for Special Contribution to Agricultural Technology Development, and the Association of Professional Bodies of Nigerian Professionals Excellence Award at the 48th anniversary of Obafemi Awolowo University. He is a current registered engineer. Professor Michael Fabrode was the immediate past vice chancellor of the Obafemi Awolowo University, Ilefe, and is currently the Secretary General, Association of Vice Chancellors. It's on this note that I strongly believe that, aside from a beautiful presentation by this erudite administrator, widely traveled, brilliant, and distinguished scholar of no mean repute. The lecture is going to be insightful, enriching, impactful, and value-adding to all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the, to the podium Professor Michael Fabrodi as he presents the convocation lecture. Good afternoon, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Let me thank the Vice Chancellor for reading the citation. It's not uh, very often that you have a Vice Chancellor reading your citation. So <laughs> it's, it's a great honor uh, to get that done today. Let me recognize the members of uh, Council who are here. I, I was uh, with the chairman a short while ago. The vice chancellor, deputy vice chancellor, and other members of university management, the deans, and I must recognize the chairman committee of deans, because I was once in that position. And I know <laughs> how very powerful the Shama Committee of this can be in the scheme of things. So I need to recognize him so that he doesn't uh, play any trick while sitting down there. <laughs> Other highly distinguished members of the university community, and in that respect, I must recognize the former Vice Chancellor, Professor. B.C. Balogun is, is an accomplice, so <laughs> I, must, I must recognize him. And I understand there is somebody from uh, a distant planet here, from uh, the Florida Technical and uh, Mechanical University, Tamu. You are welcome. Um, other members of the university community, and I must recognize the students of FUTA, great FUTARIANS, great FUTARIANS. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a great pleasure for me to be here um, for this very special uh, lecture, the Convocation Lecture of 2017. And I hope some of the graduates who we are celebrating with this lecture also here. Um, please, I will, you are operating, so I will prompt before you move on because it's not exactly as the lecture is. I would like to acknowledge the great honor of being chosen to deliver the year 2017 Convocation Lecture of this great university, the Federal University of Technology, Akure. The noble tradition of special lectures during convocation started in earnest in this university long ago, and it has remained. I cannot but remember the humble beginning of this university 
way back in 1982. As the Vice Chancellor had uh, said, I was then a lecturer at the Federal Polytechnic, which was here then, now at Adwekiti. So um, the Polytechnic was the landlord of this university when it started. And we only gave two rooms to Futa then. And the two pioneer staff that I remember very well, uh, the pioneer vice chancellor, and uh, one Mr. Yoguruku were the two staff that started this university. He was later to become the registrar at IFE when I was vice chancellor. And I can already see the temptation of saying that he was a very good vice, a very good register in all his ramifications. That is putting it modestly. I must also confess, and that's the bit that the VC did not know about my about my life history, which he read out. I had not the intention of um, coming to this university in my state, on those states, when it started. And so when I completed my PhD in 86, this was the place I applied to uh, from the UK through the Nigerian University Office in London. But at the interview, my lecturers from IFE, who are consulting here then, decided that I must return to IFE, and they had their way somehow. So that's how I missed uh, starting my university career as a lecturer here in IFE. But you have to then understand the honor of coming back here because, as I said, my academic career started on these grounds, though at the Polytechnic then. And so it's um, a very interesting homecoming uh, to be here. And, I, and I'm not taking this assignment very lightly. I regard a convocation lecture on like a shorter commencement address in some universities because it affords the speaker the opportunity to espouse the intrinsic academic characteristics of erudition and boldness in the perception, dissemination, and preservation of the truth, since that is the role of academics in society. What is more, I have elected on the advice of the convocation team to speak on scholarship, globalization, and underdevelopment with our universities of technology. And of course, I must pay attention to the fact that um, I'm here at FUTA. Very pleased to see the Vice Chancellor of uh, Federal University of Technology, Mina, joining us. You are welcome. My goal is to address higher education generally or specifically specialized universities in their purpose and hence mandate as relates to relevance to humanity. And I find favor in Professor Adam Abib, is the vice chancellor and principal of University of Witt Strand in Johannesburg who was here last year to give our keynote at the opening ceremony of a VCs conference in Joss. We were here in 2013, and I remember that um, we used this very beautiful facility then. For him, the challenges for African universities are largely, one, providing access to higher education for the teaming population of Africans. African youths in particular. For us in Nigeria, if you cast your mind back to the jump of last year, the UTME, we had about 1.557 million candidates for the universities. Out of which 67.7% scored 180 and above. And so 
They are probably qualified for university admission. But we had places for only 695. So there is a gap. And so the issue of access still remains very relevant. The second challenge is producing skilled and creative graduates to tackle African development challenges. And the third, according to Professor Abib, is undertaking research to use science and innovation to provide solutions to tackle the problems of poverty, underdevelopment, and bridge the African inequality gap. For me, these are great issues for national development. And those are some of the issues that um, we, we shall be examining. So just leave it there for the time being. Now, if we take a look at the Nigerian education system, especially the university system, we agree that the nation and the universities are at crossroads. Because the problem of relevance of higher education to national development aspirations, the delivery of good governance, and the equitable distribution of the benefits of an expanded economy, as we have it, are issues that persist. And this dilemma is compounded at this point in time by the falling crude oil prices that has led us into the recession that we have at this point in time. Because the economy is not as diversified as it should be. So, at a time like this, we expect universities, as it is in other climates, as centers of knowledge, generation, propagation, and appropriation, to rise to the rescue of their nations. If you Google some universities, you will see that this is the function that some universities have played very beautifully all over the world. You can check in the UK, Manchester, Liverpool, Coventry, even Newcastle upon time, which I attended. They have used their knowledge to rebuild their communities because their logic is that when the communities were buoyant, they built the universities and established them as veritable sources of knowledge. And when there was depression in those lands, the universities worked together and developed uh, develop enterprises to put those areas back on good footing. That is what universities are supposed to do. However, ours is not exactly like that. And so we must begin to interrogate why we cannot do exactly what universities do in other lands. Let me just deepen this discourse by looking at the trajectory of the development of the Nigerian university system. You can go to the next slide. No, can you, can you go back? There's a figure there, that's the figure I want, yes. Just leave it there. Now, we have a vicious national dilemma of a badly managed and plundered monocommodity economy and a self-afflicted, degraded higher education system that ultimately lost its once vibrancy and good reputation. The result is a web of complicated and sustained national ineptitude and failure and disturbingly subsisting inability to apprehend our resource stand under development and charge a new path for prosperity. So, if you look at um, uh, the picture that we have, you can see that we can identify, we can identify three major, okay, periods. The first period, which is of the early days of the Nigerian university system. 
when universities were the pride of the nation and they found their place even in the commonwealth and so on and they were highly regarded, regarded. and universities were doing the functions that were expected of them in society so that is the golden era of the Nigerian university system and that was until uh, sometimes in the late 70s and by 80s we have that very steep descent which we refer to as the turbulent years of the Nigerian university system. Some decide to call it the years of the Holocaust. And we have not recovered from the heavy degradation that happened at that time. So, in the first era, you find that the universities had very good international flavor. They had students from all over the world. They had staff from all over the world. And academics were able to do their work very well. But in the Holocaust years, you find evidence of serious decadence. And this crept in due to the, largely due to the disdain of the military oligarchy to the radical bent of university academics. And so all through the 90s, we had it very rough. Highly unfavorable political and socio-economic climate. And of course, there were regular strikes. Even though student numbers grew, there was gross underfunding. And steadily, we had a fall in the national and even global reputation of the Nigerian university system. And there was a large exodus, which we call brain drain. And to today, a number of them are still out there. The academy had been decimated almost beyond repairs. But for what happened subsequently after? I remark here that it is significant in our discourse here that Futa was one of the specialized universities that came into being during this stressful period. So we know that as we proceed. By the turn of the 21st century, there was no way things could be allowed to degenerate further by the global community. And so there were brazen attempts to bypass government, to reach out directly to the institutions. Hence, the new phase of tepid renaissance, occasioned by intervention of some philanthropic partnerships from the early 2000s, got some universities, for instance, University of Ibadan, University of um, uh, Portacourt, uh, BUK, who benefited from the work of these foundations, Carnegie Corporation, MacArthur, Ford Foundation, and so on. So, my point here is that it is this little but steady and hope restoring recovery that has allowed the Nigerian university system the semantics of reform that a number of our universities are witnessing today in the form of strategic planning, internationalization, democratization of governance structures, and so on and so forth. But the damage that happened during the Holocaust years has remained almost permanent. And I don't think we have been able to evaluate to understand the magnitude of the structural damage that happened to Nigeria education during this time. We only got a glimpse of it in 2012-2013 during the NIST assessment. And the outcome was that catalog of woes. From toilet facilities to academic facilities to all the rest, we all can remember the outcome. 
In fact, some universities had to contest some of the findings that this could not be true. Where they said there were about 650 people to one toilet in some of the universities, and so on and so forth. I remember, and I, I can't but share with you, in 1996 or thereabouts, I just came back from my sabbatical, and having gone for a sabbatical, I could buy a car, and I was riding. You know, I used to work with those in Faculty of Arts, so I parked to see my colleagues, and I saw an elderly academic, the head of the department, coming. He parked his car at the slope, but the way he was coming, I knew he was going to need a push. So I waited. So as soon as he got near the car, I made the attempt to go and help him push the car. But he had mastered his art. He put one leg and then off he went. I almost cried. That was the loss of the academic at that time. And we then saw students coming with tires because they've told their parents, my teacher cannot buy a tire to his car. So, so that was very humiliating. And the impact of that has remained with us today in the Nigerian university system. People don't realize the catastrophic impact of such little, little things that happened to the Nigerian academic and the system. When you put this back to what happened in 75, when academics were asked to quit their university I mean houses, and they had nowhere to go, you can then see how we've had the sort of thing that we have um, in the academic system. So today, academic and non-academic staff saddle themselves with direct intervention and engagement with government by way of protests to call attention to the near decadence of academic system. In a way, in a way, protests and struggle have now replaced Thank you. Protest and struggle have now replaced the culture of inquiry, debates, and discourse inherent in academic cultures of universities. At the same time, the culture of academic mentoring had waned, while a good number of young initiates to the academy climbed on board for want of nothing else to do, and not because of the burning passion of the academics of old. From the staff side, therefore, various infractions and acts of gross misconduct, such as plagiarism, sexual harassment, sorting, moonlighting, grace for favor, sale of handouts, patronage of dubious publishing houses, establishment and running of fake publishing outlets, hitherto unknown in the academy then became the hallmark of the system. Code of conduct for staff, examination regulations, university and books became more and more irrelevant to the staff. Hence, the growth in staff disciplinary cases and so on. A similar scenario is also noted with students, where the nature, scope, and content and methodology of student protests and student unionism have changed considerably. Students have shifted their attention from ennobling fights for the downtrodden to destructive internal demonstrations at which considerable damage is done to poor infrastructure of the universities, worsening the already very bad situation. At the same time, courtism and other very nefarious crimes promoted by the off-campus system and overcrowding invaded the ranks of students in our universities, while the hapless job situation and crushing unemployment, uh, unemployment prospects demotivated students from hopes and big thoughts. The sanctity of examination now means nothing to students as examination practices have become endemic and pervasive and even encouraged by some parents right from securing university admission to undertaking final year projects 
where acute plagiarism has also infested the rank of students. The overarching scenario is that, is that we are more and more students now embrace crimes and misconducts that were alien to the university system. So, this is just for us to realize the challenges that we've had in the university system in recent times. And in the next chapter, I try to try to a review of the mandates of the Nigerian university system. That is, what have we now been doing? Because we have had it very rough, and it remains so still. Next slide. So we just quickly go through some of the uh, challenges. We need a serious commitment to human capital development to mitigate the serious deficits the number of scientists, engineers, high-level expertise, and leadership in the whole of Africa, not just Nigeria alone. This is a very serious next generation challenge to which African governments must commit themselves and through the universities. For instance, the Nigerian Science and Technology Innovation Plan of 2012, that was when we were able to at least prepare one, projects that we are going to need 2,000 PhDs every year from year 2013. But there is no synergy between science and tech and education and other sectors. So science and tech doesn't own the universities, <laughs> and so they are prescribing a mandate without corresponding uh, synergy with Ministry of Education. So that has remained in the pipeline. Universities are just doing their own. So there is no way that targets that national target can be met. We need to bridge the innovation skills gap by exploiting advances in ICT. I'll be explaining more uh, about that. Because we have to mainstream ICT into our, all the spreads of the university system. We must harness the youth bulge. We have a large youth population, but it's a double-edged sword. If we try to make provision for the youths, they will be the engine of growth and development for the nation. But if you don't do that, it will be the source of destruction for this country, as we have seen. All the sort of crimes that is going on. They have the knowledge, and so they are very good. They outshoot the police because of their knowledge. So that is a very big time bomb that is waiting to be unleashed. I know there are efforts now, but we must take this very seriously. And there must be unpretentious national commitments to the knowledge economy. If we don't do that, we we'll just continue to delude ourselves and the way things have been going. For universities, we need a new strong commitment to research. I mean, as I say this, I'm sure some people will be, I mean, agreeing and saying what is happening, for instance, here in Futa, the strides that have been taken the good steps that are going on, I agree. In terms of this research, there is a point that we cannot gloss over, but which the nation has not realized as a major development, that is winning 10 out of the 19 contested places in the African Center of Excellence bids, I mean, some, some few months ago. 10 out of 19. Thank you for clapping for Nigeria. But Nigeria has not realized what this means to national development. And some of the centers have been doing very great things in recent times. The Ebola scourge will have ravaged this country if not for some of the efforts of some of these centers, particularly the one at Redeemers University developing the test kits and doing a wonderful job in this area. So, the issue of centers of excellence is not limited to just these ones. There are other centers of excellence. There are several varieties. FUTA has several centers of excellence. The ones set up here and the ones also from the World Bank that preceded this one. Those centers have projected the image of FUTA in several ways. The same thing in other universities. But the World Bank support will go in 1918, I mean, 2018 or thereabouts. 
if we allow that to happen and we lose continuity of those centers, it will be a great shame for this country that that is the loss of those centers. So, but it's not, I mean, I said there are 19 of them in West Africa, West and Central Africa. Uh, Ivory Coast added three, so we have 23 now in West and Central Africa. The World Bank has gone ahead to establish another 23 in Southern and East Africa. And I think the one for North Africa will come very soon. So this is something all over Africa that can be networked to be the basis of our innovation value chain. So I think I can repeat the call here that the country needs to pay attention to these centers and create more in the different universities. We need to harness our natural resources for sustainable development. And in this regard, we must be guided and mainstream the sustainable development goals. There are 17 of them with 169 associated uh, targets. So that is by way of introducing the concept of where we are today, the state of our universities, and under development. But for us to appreciate more what we have been doing as universities and so on, we want to consider what are the hallmarks of world-class universities. The next slide. Now, just pause here. Now, according to the World Bank, all research universities are world-class universities. And the basis of that is that a university without research cannot impact seriously on development. And I agree absolutely because even as a teacher, a university that espouses teaching if there is no research, there is no way you can be able to update your knowledge and be very current. You will just be using old textbooks. But with research, you will remain current and you just walk your students through the body of knowledge that are current. And when it comes to impacting the third function of the university system, if you don't have research products, what are you going to extend to the communities? So, it is in the light of this that the World Bank went on to establish the research centers of excellence that I mentioned earlier. So there is some logic in the approach. Don't forget that a few years back, it was this same World Bank that advised African, African nations not to invest in higher education. But it is now agreed that nations that want to make it must invest in higher education and particularly in research. Next slide. So the drum of the World Bank has changed. And so there are now apostles of higher education and apostles of research in higher education. Now, um, OK, I can see that uh, copies have gone around, but either in the ones you have in your hands on the board, you have three circles in that diagram. That is a framework that tries to represent what are the things that happen in the university system. Now, there are several ways by which you can try to identify world-class universities. It is not new. It has been for a long time the great, the middle universities in Europe. Some of them were thought to be world class because they had this international flavor in them and they had their reputation. And a number of things can be identified. High number of qualified faculty, excellence in research, quality teaching, and so on and so forth. But in, in 2009, um, one Jamil Salmi has tried to construct this model to make it very simple to be able to understand what we mean by the concept of world-class universities. And 
I hope this will not make noise again. In that diagram, you can see the two cycles. The three cycles. It shows the three spheres trying to aggregate the different factors. One is concentration of talents, and that relates to academic staff, students, and all the features that will help to promote a university. The one on the left here is very obvious, abundant resources. Because we say without money, nothing can be done. But it is not just money. It is the totality of resources for the system. And when we talk of resources, we also talk of laboratories, classrooms, workshops, and so on and so forth. Like this beautiful hall. If this hall is not here, if we are cramped in, um, in a small place, none of us will be comfortable. I remember a time that um, one of our colleagues who came from the UK uh, whispered and says, in Nigeria, they land by rumor mongering. How does that happen? When you have a class that cannot take more than 200 and you put 1,000 students, the only means of communication is by rumor. So some are at the window. They don't hear what the lecturer in front is saying. So from the back, we ask, what's the lecturer saying? Then the next one says, what's, what's the lecturer saying? So by the time it gets transmitted, that will be distorted. So they all communicate by rumor mongering. That shows you must have the resources. There is no other way to it. I mean, when, if you look at that curve again, in the early days, in our universities, some of these facilities were in their best shapes, the laboratories. I remember then, each time I go to the University of Badon, you have those beautiful laboratories for chemistry, for biochemistry, for physics, and students will be there buried for the whole day. I had a cousin who was really messy. I mean, by the time it comes out, you are sure that this one has really imbibed knowledge. But these days, those laboratories are gone, those workshops are gone. And we, we now teach what is called theory of practicals until we start to make amends. So there is no way that the products can be as superior as those when we had good facilities. So the third component is good governance, favorable governance. And that relates to all the aspects of governance, the structure of the university, governing council, senate, the various committees, committee of deans, um, they show the L all networking, the running of the system, how the finances are managed, the reporting system, and so on. So when you look at the total of this, then you find the points of intersection. What are the products? You will find this listed in the book. The products of the system in the circle you can see graduates, and we are talking of good graduates. You have research outputs. And then you have knowledge transfer, technology transfer. Those are the things you used to measure to be able to see, is a university relevant? Is it meeting the goods? Of course, we must produce graduates for the economy. But there must be graduates that are able to subscribe to the challenges of the nation. And that's why we say for now that you ask, are Nigerian universities producing the right quality of personnel for the Nigerian economy? Do we have enough research outputs? Before we even talk, are we transferring those knowledge to the communities for development? And I want to say that universities of technology in particular are created to fulfill, in particular, the function of technology transfer, of impacting on the society. So, you can read more in the text about this concept of world-class universities 
And that model has been tested in some, other, in some 11 countries, including Hong Kong, Korea, Singapore, Malaysia, India, and of course, Nigeria. University of Ibadan was the institution that was one of those studies. And you begin to have a better understanding of how universities perform all over the world. So, I know that sometimes we, we do say that um, the ranking of universities is badly favored towards African universities because some of those parameters are not what we worry about. When the vice chancellor is worrying about roads, about light, about water, and so on for students, instead of worrying about the quality of academic staff that is able to get and bring from other areas where they are doing very well. I mean, you see an academic that can improve your system, you buy him over and you commission him to do some serious research. You bring him to collaborate with some staff. You bring young ones to study under him and they are doing research that has impact on society. But we can't do that here because the system doesn't allow it. When we talk about quality of students, one of it is also the ratio of undergraduate to postgraduate students. University of Ibadan made a move recently, uh, about a few years ago, seven or so years ago, in their strategy plan, they decided to become a postgraduate university. And there is logic in that. You contend with less problems, you are dealing with very mature students, and they are involved in research. The source of most research in the university system is postgraduate studentship. That is when you can, that's why academics can do a lot of research. It is through postgraduate studentship. So if you focus on postgraduate training, then you are going to have a number of commensurate research. And that is the logic. And you have table one to justify this from University of Ibadan to Harvard, to Stanford, to MIT. You see the high ratios of graduate studentship. It has meaning. And that has also been done for uh, um, the University of Lagos. Now, there is also the issue of relevance to mission or fidelity. Because when we talk, we said, no, some of these things are not relevant to us. But when we talk about relevance to mission, then you can see, is the university delivering the goods for the immediate community, for the nation, or for wherever it finds itself? And that is why the thought, something there, is very important. And so, there are other classifications that is based on this issue of technology transfer. You have the principle of knowledge creation, knowledge dissemination, that is one attribute. Second attribute, knowledge infrastructure. How much of it does a university have? If you don't have the appropriate knowledge infrastructure, as I've said, there is no way you can produce the right quality of graduates or do the right quality of research. Are there centers of inventive activities and knowledge exchange and so on and so forth? And the other thing about promotion of convenient knowledge, I will come to that a bit later. So, from this body of work, some factors that can accelerate becoming world-class universities have been identified. And next slide. So you can see them there. Some institutions have used leverage on diaspora, and some countries have done this very well. China, India, when their nationals were in the US and elsewhere, they have leveraged on this. A number of the hospitals that Nigerians run to in India and Co. They came from the US to establish them. The IT companies, those who brain drained earlier, they are those people who have now come back to establish these hospitals, these IT companies. That is why today, India is on the ascendancy in spite of the large population. That is why today, China, with the large population, is right up there. I saw an article today that Nigerians are going to borrow money from India, from China. With their small population, they can't do with all their resources they have. Those big countries, with all their challenges, they are feeding themselves and they are throwing crumbs at us and everybody is rushing to China to go and look for a loan, look for something. These are matters that we should be crying. 
because we have what we can do with ourselves that we are not doing. So, um, concentrating on niche areas, focusing on a particular area where you can sell. It is agriculture you want to do, do agriculture and make sure that everybody knows that this university in terms of agriculture is the best and you just have to go there to be able to get things done. Uh, or benchmarking. Benchmarking is just comparing yourselves with others. Those that are above you, those that are at par with you and you make yourself happy, consider those that are below you and uh, justify why you are still doing what you are doing. But these are some of the issues. But in spite of all these challenges, universities, they don't exist in isolation. Next slide. Universities don't exist in isolation. Universities are within the community. And so you have other issues that are also coming into play. Um, Macroeconomic environments in the country. Nigeria is in a recession. So who is not affected? And that's why when issues are going on, we should all be concerned. Some people will say, I'm not a politician. What they are doing does not affect me. But it will affect you. Now we are in recession. Is it only the politicians who are in recession? It is all of us. All of us are suffering from the mistakes of the few who are mismanaging the affairs of the country. When people keep on looting the economy and so on, and we fail to, I mean, to talk. We see bad things going, we don't talk. Then we are all going to pay for it. So here now we are in recession. So the macro environment affects everything, including the university system. Leadership at the national level, the sort of national assembly you have. When you take university budgets to national assembly, do they even know what a university is? Do they know what to expect of universities? When you say you have made a discovery, does anybody care at the national assembly? Is that not that one they go shop? So these are issues. So there is no motivation. For even people who do research and try to help the economy. Governance, regulatory framework, quality assurance, and so on, all these are summarized in that figure to show that a university is as good also as the environment. But my own caution there is that universities will always try not to allow society to sort them and destroy their integrity as we have done in this country. Universities must remain afloat and ensure that they lead society. That is the work of universities. And until we take that obligation and work on it assiduously, the Nigerian university system will continue to be despised and not accorded recognition that it deserves. So I want to quickly move on to universities of technology and their mandates. And it is very important that we must locate universities in the innovation value chain. Um, universities have never been as crucial to nation states as they are today. This, as we earlier averred, is because in order to compete in the global economy, Nations need their universities to produce and apply knowledge and to produce knowledgeable and well-skilled workers. Thank you. Across the skills spectrum. Against the background of the hallmark of world-class universities that we have just considered, we can proceed to make some remarks concerning universities of technology. And I will be focusing also on FUTA. I am convinced that the decision in the 1980s to establish universities of technology in Nigeria was forthright and well conceived. Because after independence, there were strident efforts to move Nigeria economy away from commodity exports which the colonialists had foisted on us 
and the nation began to undertake some industrialization for regrowth. The establishment of state-owned manufacturing enterprises was the main feature of policy initiative with huge capital investment in iron and steel industries, petrochemical plants, fertilizer plants, and so on by government, as well as encouraging some private industries in the chemical and auto sectors. That was when we had the Volkswagens, Pijo, Leyland trucks, and so on. There really was an attempt to lay the building blocks or basis for enduring industrialization in the country. And these efforts were guided by a succession of national development plans in the 70s and 80s. Hence, the establishment of the technological universities was consistent with Nigeria's quest for industrialization and technological emancipation. Such universities were to be the innovation hubs for national development. They were to be entrepreneur, entrepreneurial and highly enterprising universities. They were to be hotbeds of creativity, spinning off businesses and enterprises. They were to mimic Stanford University and be the abingas of our national innovation ecosystem. the Silicon Valley of development. To understand what this entails, I want to briefly take us to the concept of innovation value chain. And can you just go to the, the, the next uh, figure? Yeah. Because that summarizes, I think those who have it, they have it um, uh, as figure four, the various components, the first um, box up there is a collection of all the factors. By the way, the factors are here, are those used in trying to assess countries for their innovative tendencies and the ability to use knowledge for development. So there are 84 factors in all that have been grouped and regrouped into what we have done. So if you go through the text, you will be able to understand a number of these. And this was developed by the World Intellectual Property Organization and Cornell University, and it has been used over the years. And countries look out to the outcome every year to know their station in development. So, what we have done is to try and put them into these four major blocks. The policy and operating environment, which refers to the institutions, the infrastructure, the venture capital, and so on. And the triple helix, that is the collaboration between universities and industry, mediated by government, and so on. And so, that is the first Port of call, the one at the top. Now, what that says is that you don't just start any process without proper planning. Remember I said earlier, we add some modicum of other development when we add national plans. Today, we don't have such national plans, and so somebody comes and says, seven-point agenda. Another one comes and says, 25-point agenda and so on and so forth. So there is no coordination. And there is no link between federal, state, and local government. In fact, the local government system has been destroyed. They have been pocketed by the state governors, just as they have also pocketed their assemblies. And so those all marks of separation of power are not there, mainly at the state level. At the federal level, where you have a semblance of that, you can see what's going on in Senate now all sort of contradictions. And we want to believe that we can make progress under these sort of distortions and so on. Until those systems are reformed, we are not starting, we are not embarking yet on the journey of national development. So, 
Um, let me just say that for that. Now, the next box on the right, going clockwise, is the human capital and the research conundrum. Human capital, research, research centers of excellence, as we have done, and all things related to knowledge and research infrastructure. That is where universities are located. That is where research institutes are located. So, it shows the place of higher institution and research in the innovation value system. And countries that don't understand this, we continue to neglect and ignore their universities because that is the center for research and knowledge generation. And no country these days will develop without using knowledge. Um, I will talk about that again later. Next to that, at the bottom, that's in the clockwise, is the research uptake and the innovation step. And this is where a number of things happen. Business sophistication, knowledge and technology outputs, creative outputs, sustainable cities, and so on. Uh, incubation centers, technology parks, and so on and so forth. Now, the outcome of all these three is what leads to development. Technology acquisition and transfer, economic growth, poverty reduction, nation building, employment, and so on. Those are the outcomes. And at the national level, the output from the impacts of all these innovation and so on is used to refine the policy. That's why policy will not be static. But the policy must be linked to the history of what has happened before. You don't just come and wake up and abandon all what your predecessor has been doing and say you are a government of uh, progress or something else or change. And then you start from day one. You are going to be in serious problem. So policy refinement. Sorry, it's not very clear in this one. Uh, there's a new diagram that we have modified that. On this axis on the left of the policy, there is policy refinement. And so the output is also refined and better policy. And that's how the, the countries grow. That's how things happen. So um, I just want to make a point that is very relevant um, uh, to the university uh, system. From what we have seen, the issue of knowledge transfer, I mean, uptake of technology is the key missing point that we have in this country. Of course, we are not doing enough research, but the research that we even do, what happens to it? They are on the shelves here and there. I'm an agric engineer and I'm familiar with what has happened here in agric engineering over the years. Starting from the work on water hyacinth, uh, cassava harvesters, and so on. I've examined some of the works. I've worked with a number of your uh, colleagues. You have even developed, you've perfected all of the cassava production chain. But who has come up to take one of the plants and begin to market it? At Ife, over the years, the only innovation that was commercialized was the yam pandi machine, which was developed as far back as 1972, before I entered the university. But I saw it for the first time at a trade fair. In those days, there used to be very good agri trade fairs in the Kare. That was when I saw the yam pandi machine in its raw form. And later, it was exhibited all over the country. And the, Chinese, uh, the Japanese came, copied it, and they brought it back, and Nigerians were very crazy about that one. And we forget, how can Japanese be pounding yam? Do they know, <laughs> Do they know what yam is eh? to develop yam panda? They stole that technology from us. The man who developed the yam panda today now is over, is, is, is over 80. He's there in Elisha. I think it's a, it's a sad commentary for this country that. People like that, we just be allowed to waste. 
that is somebody that has, will have been developed, that will have trained several people. Each time I go to his factory now, he's looking for Nepa. From morning to night, Prof may be trying to see how he will get Nepa. Maybe for one hour. Old man. So how can we develop? How can we translate those researches into innovations that will build the nation? So, that step is very important. And let me just read this point here. From the above, we vividly see the intrinsic place of technology transfer in innovation value chain. When construed to also include some element of knowledge transfer as a precursor to technology transfer, then we see that causing it to happen requires careful planning and orchestration from human capital development, research conception and prosecution, such that in the case of agriculture, for example, farmers are integrated into the planning process right from the beginning. The lesson in this for universities generally, and universities of technology in particular, is that the research uptake and innovation function, which should be their hallmark and their most distinguishing feature requires specialized stroke independent structures. And there are several models, including university ventures, incubation centers, knowledge parks, technology parks, that should not impair their basic research and development function. Hence, governance of such entities must be handled by experts and separated from academic functions. Academics must face their teaching and research. Graduate supervision and leave politics to politicians. I mean, they should leave management to people with requisite professional expertise. This may be a point that people will think is trivial, but it's very important. In the university system, we have ventures, we have some knowledge centers, and so on. And professors will struggle to head these centers. This is not the place for professors. Professors who face their teaching, graduate supervision, and their research, and produce more research. But work in partnership with those who have the expertise to convert these things to products and innovations. At IFE, we had the, the ventures, and I made sure that we brought in people with expertise from outside to man these areas. Our investments, our advancements, and so on. And I used to boast that I'm learning my MBA from these industry giants. Because that is what they know how to do. It, it doesn't diminish your position by saying somebody should head all these units. It only makes for efficiency of the system. We should learn from those that we are copying. That is the way these things are run in other areas. So, it is very, very important that we must take this issue seriously. And the rest is a few things about contemporary issues in technology transfer and mission relevance of universities. That universities should emplace appropriate innovation governance in the system. The next slide. Um, because what we have is slow uptake of um, uh, research products and so on. Next. Now, when we talk about governance of these entities, I think the time has come that universities should know that in the mix of factors that we raise a university, ICT and research, they have become totally indispensable. So universities must ensure that all their processes are driven by ICT. Everything must be ICT driven. And also research. Even research administration itself. Um, I know those of us who are in Warima knows that research management is not as simple as ABC. You have to know what you are doing to get the grants, to manage the grants and obtain the resources so that it can benefit humanity. So, universities need proper structures. Next. 
And this may not be clear, but I try to put something there that says, from the Vice Chancellor, then there must DVC Research, Development, and Innovation. I think Futa has already taken a good step in that regard. The research function is so important that somebody must be devoted solely to research and innovation management. It is not trying to dissipate uh, functions. It is because the, it is very, very important and crucial to the success of the university, the research and innovation function. And of course, there must be a proper directorate for research in universities, which will ensure that you have somebody in charge of ICT and also somebody in charge of research, collaborating and working. And I plead with you, ensure that there is a coordination between the supporting function of the registry and the academics. Because I've noticed this. We do so much in ICT, we do so much in research, but the rest of the university does not know what is going on. Because we don't have a proper administrative structure as part of the research and the ICT network. And so that is what the suggestion there is trying to correct. So, an innovation uptake is one of the things that must be emphasized as a function. Management of intellectual property, grants and proposal writing, uh, training and capacity building. Of course, this is not all, because I, I can't claim to know everything. There are other things that others can include. But as part of strategic planning, let the university think out a proper governance structure that will ensure that the university is able to deliver what it's supposed to do. I also um, plead that for proper management of technology transfer and doing all the other advanced functions, the registry must be professionalized. The registry must be professionalized. You must have those who specialize in advancement. You must have those who specialize in research management so that when they do things, they do, look, when I was at IFE, there was a United States, Nigeria, I mean, Africa collaboration. And there is a grant prospecting system. When the call came, we used our own native system, meetings, and so on and so forth. And then we now linked up with those that will be our partners, MIT, on our iLab project. By the time we got in touch with MIT, it was just an administrative person that was communicating. But you can see how organized the system was and the professionalism. All that the professors do is to feed with information. These people are trained to know how to write the proposal, the right keywords, and everything. And it was effortless. We were struggling to meet the timelines. Thank God we had our ICT and we could communicate then. In fact, we would have lost out completely. At the end of the day, we, suc we succeeded, but I could see how much we labored. And the ease, because the structures are there for them to do this. So, as I said, let us learn from those that we are trying to copy. And that is what is being uh, advocated. So, you have somebody in the research section, it must be a professionally competent person. That, before you open your mouth, he knows what you want to say and they are summarized. They have templates for writing proposals. They have templates for, because you have to justify the research. What are going to be as, uh, expected outcomes? What are going to be impacts? What are the risks that are involved? If you ignore all these things, and those of you who are in ethics, you know that you have to factor all these things into your research proposal. If you don't do it, you will not be getting the very uh, heavy researches that can develop the system. A few other things, capacity building is very important so that we can bring on the young ones. Engaging international, regional, industrial research partnership. I will say FUTA is doing very well in this regard. I've seen some of the compendium. And prioritizing civic engagement. Ensuring that staff that are involved in community development, national development, are rewarded. They must be rewarded. So there must be a way of factoring it so that people don't see it as something that is not important in the university assessment system. 
I mean, somebody brings you, yes, it's, um, I will soon be rounding up. I mean, somebody brings you very important goodwill, is able to link with governments here and there, you must reward that system. And in that regard, I say, I know that FUTA has always had a strong town gown engagement with um, the Akure community, and that this should be, conti should be continued. And also that FUTA is in Ondo State, and so there should be partnership with those Ondo State government. When the new government was going to come, there was a series of committees that were set up. I know there are members of FUTA there, but this should be formalized so that there could be you know, proper synergy and working together. Farmers around here in order to benefit from the knowledge that is coming out of FUTA. Businessmen and co, they should benefit from what is coming out of here. And you never know, you learn a lot by working with these people. Uh, that's my own experience. In the work that we have done with rural women, I have learned a lot. I learned a lot by working with rural communities. It will improve your teaching. It will improve your understanding of the world. And when you bring your students, programmer students and co, to be part of this, it benefits them tremendously. And this is what I advocate that we must be engaged with our civic community. I am almost finishing, but I said we must exploit knowledge convergent technologies. Now, what are knowledge convergent technologies? As, um, um, yeah, okay, a few examples are there, but let me define the term convergent technologies. It describes the phenomenon of synergistic combination of nanotechnology, biotechnology, information technology, and cognitive science. For instance, if you take the biological science for example, there is convergence of techniques and practice to encompass genomics, molecular biology, agricultural and industrial biotechnology, and so on and so forth. If you take material science and technologies, you talk of advances in nanotechnology, smart materials, high performance materials, advanced catalytic materials, and so on. The benefits attending to this is unimaginable. And ICT in particular substantially enables and amplifies the breadth, reach, and timely application of other technologies. That is the reality. When you are able to combine use of ICT with other technologies, the frontiers become almost limitless. And that is why universities must deepen the use of ICT. It is the new thing that is going on now, and I think we must buy into this. The main point that we are stressing is that scientific and technological convergence has brought a lot of fruitful advantages, different fields of science. And this is particularly very useful for us in this country. We, we are part of the underdeveloped world. There are a number of technologies that are out there that we can harness and multiply just by knowledge of the availability and be able to communicate with them. The, the Nigerian Research and Education uh, uh, REN, the NGREN, working with the West African uh, REN, is able to link up with other RENs all over the world. And what is being tried to be developed is to divide scientific communities that you take advantage and use these things. Those in weather forecasting know that when they want to exchange data, it's always very big amount of data. You need specialized handling to be able to exchange this data. And that is why you must understand how ICT can help you. Things that you cannot do before, you are now able to do. I'm sure there are a number of um, uh, examples that I've given uh, in, the, in the book. Let me just say that I mentioned Redeemers University earlier in terms of the centers of excellence. The work that they have done in Ebola is based on molecular bio biotechnology, genomics, and so on. And today, they have published not less than four articles in Nature. That is the top journal in any field. Four articles in Nature. An article there has 
impact rating of about 45. That is a single article in Nature. There are articles that publications that are not, they don't have 0 0.001. <laughs> a single publication will carry 45. So if their work can enter such publication, then you know that something good is coming out of this country. But that is what the government of this country has not realized that they must capitalize. Such things can only happen in the university. And that is the message that we are telling them. If you invest in the universities, you cannot predict what is going to happen. The knowledge explosion will lead to development explosion. All our use, you see wonderful things that they are doing with all these ICT things. When your television breaks down, your handset breaks down, it is this one that you have. I don't even worry myself. I give it to them. Because this is their own natural, they are millennial people. This is their own environment. This is what they are millennial people. But we must direct them to use it usefully and not other nefarious uses. So the country has to enable this use to be able to do this. The last point before I summarize is the issue of mission creep in technological and other specialized universities. I know it's a topic in recent times and I don't think I can be pardoned for coming here without mentioning something about this. I'm in Futa, technological university. And if I don't talk about mission creep that has engaged our attention in recent times, then people will say maybe I'm, I'm not being very patriotic or I don't want to hit a point that is very important. It is the universities of technology and agriculture were established in the 80s to serve special purpose in line with national development, as earlier noted. It was, however, not contemplated that they would aspire to change their color and forge convergence towards traditional conventional universities. So, this development has attracted severe lamentations in public commentary. And I'm just trying to bring some of them. That there are people who blame the imagined mission creep in the agricultural sector, for example, as to the failure of Nigeria's effort at effective extension services and the attainment of food security. Those in technology also blame it on our not being able to achieve technological emancipation and industrial competitiveness. What is more, even for Africa, this was the outcome of the 2015 Education Summit in Dakar, that countries should promote diversification and differentiation of higher education and develop criteria to prevent mission creep and so on. So, in our conference, our summit in November, this issue was also taken up. And shortly after, government came with a directive. And this is the dangerous part. When you allow government to dictate what should happen, then you begin to see consequences of irrational decision. It is like we say in accreditation, in quality assurance, universities must institute their own structures to guarantee quality assurance. Then you call others, come and see what we are doing. Don't wait until somebody will come and hit you and say, why are you doing this? That is very derogative for universities. So, um, the summit admonished universities to keep to their mandate while recommending appropriate follow-up actions to fill the policy gap with commensurate legislation. Government has subsequently directed affected universities to be assisted to keep their mandate by NUC and JAMP. I think that, is, that should not be the way things should happen. We advocate that whatever corrective measures that are to be adopted should be mindful of not creating worse complications for affected stakeholders. The omen is that universities must understand their origin, mandate, strategic vision, and laws and be properly guided by these instruments to undertake such fundamental reform that will lead to mission creep. So what we are saying there is government should not take irrational decisions, even when a mistake will appear to have been made. It does take some time to be able to correct uh, such 
such things. But I think it is the duty of the university to think out strategically how to respond to some of these challenges. So I would like to summarize. I think I'm ahead of the time allotted to me now. <laughs> Universities have never been as crucial to national states as they are today. These such nations are to be competitive in the global economy. They need their university sectors to produce and apply knowledge and to produce knowledgeable and well-skilled workers across the skill spectrum. Universities must therefore be well-funded, accorded needed recognition, and in return, they must not be found wanting in responding to this crucial need that will determine their relevance and social value. In this regard, universities generally, and in particular universities of technology, which have the research uptake and innovation function as their hallmark and most distinguishing feature, require specialized through independent structures and expertise or special purpose vehicles that should not impair their basic academic research and development functions. Globalization, in spite of its enslaving potentialities to weak nations in a squid world order, when coupled with the emergence of convergent technologies, which have identified to be nanotechnology, biotechnology, genomics, cognitive science, and ICTs, have provided a platform for less developed nations. But this must be through their universities and higher education institutions to be active players in exploiting science, technology, and innovation for their development. Universities of technology are particularly critical in helping their nations to take advantage of this opportunity. My reading of Futa points to the picture of an institution which is robustly coming of age, having grown to a sprawling estate of cascading structures and architecture with an impressive network of roads, a solid built environment, a monument of some sort, and into a large family of a variety of formal and informal staff, dependents and benevolent entrepreneurs stroke traders, all numbering over 36,000. If the past and present must be molded into shaping the future, then I can see a future severing the exploits of its solid foundation and its reinforcement by the present incursion and transition into the global arena to forecast a future of stupendous knowledge and research-led innovation, accomplishments, wealth creation, and nation building. Every inhabitant of this planet called Futa, not least the incoming successor vice chancellor, who will be a proud primary beneficiary, must eagerly be looking forward to such a looming dawn. I thank you all for listening. Shall we sustain the applause? Indeed, the standing ovation is more than well deserved. Shall we graciously take our seat? I'd like to quickly invite the chairman of today's occasion, our vice chancellor, Professor Adebi Gregory Daramola. Of knowledge, we are universities of technology like us 
should be plain and how we can contribute to pushing the knowledge, the frontiers of knowledge. Uh, that was a very beautiful lecture, but time is not on our side, so I'm going to invite one or two comments and or questions from the audience. So what you're going to do for us, you're going to identify yourself, Professor Ademosu first, you will identify yourself, then you ask your question or comment. Thank you very much, sir. I'm Cornelius Ademosu. My more of a comment, but I hope um, the lecturer team may want to say one or two words on, on my comment. We have again be giving a document today. But this one is a special one. What about the implementation? Who is to implement is the politicians. I will keep on blaming the politicians. When I was in um, my undergraduate two years at TFE, my national will say, ah, if we can have one or two or three of us in Abuja, this country will be a better place. But if you go to Abuja today, for the past couple of years that I've been in, perhaps you go to Abuja, or there was I was going there regularly. Enter any office, you will find a professor there or an academic, either as director or something like that. They, 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 they were all there. Has the social input? Has the social input? Now, coming back to our own universities, individual universities, a teacher, whether I was an undergraduate, the university teaching. Me, research plan was provided crops for the staff and students. They were able to feed this, but all the staff and students. Today, even here in Twitter, many years ago, there was a food processing small factory, and it was able to process some fruits, and we were using them as Senate meetings, council meetings, and so on and so forth. <laughs> I've been disturbed, frankly. There is God and there will be judgment. Unfortunately, two, two subsets of people are involved. Those who call themselves Christians and the, the second subset, academics, unfortunately, are belong to the two subsets. Why, why, why should it be like this? Frankly, why should we be like this? Why are we not able to produce? In fact, it's, it's actually happy. Good enough that we have some of these private universities now that, like, that are like secondary schools. Otherwise, we have many of our PhD students, PhD graduates, who will not be able to secure a job. It's then we will then, and in fact, we should, we should have started to realize, to realize it, that PhD, professorship, they are not the ends in themselves. They are means to an end. It's high time we realize that in this country. Why is it with, with all these highly billion people who go abroad and develop the industries abroad? Why do we come back here and say we cannot establish industries? Even within the university that is making use of our research findings. Why should we call somebody a professor? A professor of engineering? and there is nothing to show for it. It is true. Why is the world a professor of agriculture and all he's doing is just to collect previous data and subject them to statistical analysis? I think it's high time we really think about this. And if we are saying that all these um, politicians and we are the one influencing them there, if we are saying we, they should not do it in our individual universities, let us go into production. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. My question is that, uh, can you hear me? I 
name is Ake Aino, the product of this school. I've been in the manufacturing sector for about 25 years. I discovered that there is a disconnect between the university research focus and what the industry needs. And so you find that there is a lot of research output on the shelf that you know no one is actually looking at within the industry. Recently, some group of veterans who are just recognize the presence of civil defense. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on.